the following takes place between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. It's Political Vindication Radio. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Who sees firsthand the concrete and mortar, the guard posts and machine gun towers, the dog runs and the barbed wire can ever again take for granted his or her freedom or the precious gift that is America. All this stuff you've heard about America not wanting to fight, wanting to stay out of the war, is a lot of horse stuff. Americans love to fight. All real Americans love to stay in the battle. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome to Political Vindication Radio, where bloggers come to discuss the issues. I'm your host, Frank, also known as Uncle Seth the Noble. And I'm Shane, also known as Ever Vigilant. Tonight, we have a very special guest, historian and book author Dr. Thomas E. Woods, Jr., he will be here to talk about the building blocks of Western civilization and how the Roman Catholic Church was directly involved in stacking those blocks. And, um, man, we got a guest tonight who's an accomplished academic and an author and whose latest book is a treat for the amateur historian. Uh, let me put this up here for us. Let me see if you guys can read that. 33 questions about American history you're not supposed to ask. And... Uh, Now, we could have had uh, Professor Woods on to talk about that, but if you listen to Michael Medved or any of the other top radio hosts, you've already heard that interview. We wanted to talk to him tonight about his book, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. I'll put that up here, too. Here, I don't know if you can read that. Not as clear as I'd like. But uh, now that's a topic that's really interesting. Thomas E. Woods, Jr., winner of the Templeton uh, Enterprise Awards in 2006, Heck, if you go to his website, thomasewoods.com, his bio is there, and and it ought to be the envy of every man and woman alive. And he's here with us today. Professor Woods, thanks for coming on Political Vindication Radio. Well, my pleasure, uh, Shane and Frank. Nice to be here. Awesome. Hey, before we get started, Professor, can you tell us a little bit about the passion that drives a man who earns a bio like you've got? Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Well, I, I mean... You know, I, I'm I'm the sort of guy who um, I guess I take some real pleasure in overturning myths. And given how many of them there are out there, I, I can pretty much make a second career out of doing nothing but that. <laughs> so, I mean, it it drives me crazy when to know that there are so many things that people believe about American history that are not only false but grotesquely false, and yet that everybody believes and they just keep being perpetuated. Or likewise about the Christian religion, or Catholicism in particular, again, countless absurdities people believe about it, and that are taught to students. I mean, I used to teach uh, college students in New York back when I lived up there. And, you know, the students I would get in my classes, they had their heads filled with nonsense. But when they came into my classroom, I mean, I didn't say, boy, these are a bunch of stupid kids. I just thought, well, this is what they've been taught. What, What else are they supposed to think? You know, I almost don't blame them for having their heads filled with myths. So what motivates me, you know, to, not to sound melodramatic, but is a desire to set the record straight on so many things you know, on behalf of the good guys, you know, who constantly are finding themselves on the wrong end of mythology here. So that's part of the reason that, as you say with my bio, you know, I have written a lot, I have produced a lot, because, you know, frustration is sort of my muse. You know, I'm just so frustrated with uh, with textbooks and with the with the with the establishment version of American history or of church history that you know I just can't, you know in other words if I don't write about it I'm going to stay up all night griping to my wife about it <laughs> so I think she would rather just have me write books <laughs> I think she appreciates that yeah that's great you know in fact one of your my favorite titles about you is that you're the anti Howard Zinn you're the anti Zinn yeah that's right I don't know how you found that, but that yeah the New York Post called me the yeah. right wing's answer to Howard Zinn and I thought <laughs> That's probably like the best thing I've ever been called. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wood, this is Frank. Uh, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Woods, first of all, let me say, um, you know, when I was reading your book, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, I, you know, there has a, I haven't read a book in a long time that touched my heart as dear as this book. You know, back in the early 90s, I went through my own 
conversion, through my own Catholic conversion, study a lot of apologetics. And then when I went into a, a university down in San Diego um, and taking the basic history courses, the, the Western Civ courses, and I even took a, a course in the history of Brazil, viciously anti-Catholic. Boy, I can't tell you how bad some of these courses were. were. And so reading your book, truly refreshing, truly refreshing. I want to thank you for it uh, because, you know, it's inspired me. Uh, it really has. But, but to get to your book, Dr. Woods, um, it appears that the notion of, uh, of your book is that the Catholic Church was a, a major contributor to many of the privileges that we find in Western culture. Can you explain to our audience why history has failed to recognize the Church's contributions? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, it's not even just historians. It's also you know, current commentators. I mean, right now, just when you think prejudices and anti-Christian bias and, and sentiments can't get any worse, these past couple of years have just been... I mean, just been worse than I could have imagined. We've had, you know, we've got Richard Dawkins, we've got Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett, and a whole a slew of them, just one after the other, and they've all been smash sellers, and they've really put people, you know, Christians on the defensive. And it's it's been, as I say, it's just been qu quite overwhelming. Um, so it's not only, so it's not just his, his historians, it's also current people, but it's true that that for a long time, in our history books, we would not get any any sense that the Christian inheritance in the West has been a positive thing, or, or what exactly are the practical consequences of the Christian faith in the West? Like, what, what did it actually do? What good things did it do? What we normally hear is, you know, well, the Christians were just uh, burning everybody at the stake, and that was the end of it. I mean, that's the view that everybody has, and, and Chris, they, hate, they hate learning, they, they love ignorance. I mean, it's all this kind of crazy nonsense. And part of the reason that that held true for so long, that we got this taught to us, is that there's been a prejudice at the heart of Western civilization since the 18th century with the Enlightenment. Because the Enlightenment sort of took for granted that all progress comes from modern, liberal, secular intellectuals. And therefore, if you're not a modern, liberal, secular intellectual, you could not be an instrument of progress. You must have brought about retrogression and superstition and ignorance. So therefore, when you go and when you when you have that kind of prejudice, and you go to investigate the historical record, well, you're going to look, for, you know, you're going to look for that. You're you're, you're in effect, you're not going to look for the church's contributions because, according to you, there aren't any. Every everything that's good about the West must have a secular source, and that's going to be the prejudice that drives your writing. So for for a couple of hundred years now. We've had histories written that try to suggest that, for example, all economic thought just developed in the 18th century with Adam Smith and other free thinkers, or um, all scientific thought just started spontaneously and was a reaction against the church, or and so on and so forth, or charitable ideas, or anything that we associate with the West, we get, or, or like human rights, the idea of rights, that, that we have natural rights. This also just came spontaneously out of, uh, of the Enlightenment, we get told. Well, every single statement I just made there is false, but you, no one would ever sense that, that they're false because this is what we're all taught. I was taught this stuff that you know that that uh, religious people hate science and they want to burn the scientists. I was taught all this stuff. So what has happened? I'm happy to report over the past 50 or 60 years is that finally this prejudice has started to melt away, at least among scholars who take their commitment to the truth seriously. And all of a sudden, you've started to have, for example, in the history of science, we have had our absolute revolution in our understanding of the history of science. Like, for example, if you were to go into a university classroom today in a history of science course with somebody with a Ph.D. in that field and stand up there and say that the Christian religion has been nothing but an obstacle to the development of science, you would be laughed at. I mean, I know this sounds hard to believe because most of the time universities are just a horror show from our point of view, but... But on this, when you have professors with integrity, they will actually say, no, that's not true. We might have believed that 100 years ago, but that is so old news now that, that today the consensus, I mean, this actually is true among, among specialists who are historians of science, the consensus among both Catholic and non-Catholic historians of science alike is that, no, it is not accurate to say that religion and science have been nothing but antagonists in the history of the West. And to the contrary, it seems more accurate to say that the Christian religion was an important support for the sciences, both materially and ideologically, 
and I, I can elaborate on that in a minute. But the point is that this has changed. I mean, we've had scholars like um, um, uh, J. L. Heilbron at Berkeley. We've had A. C. Crombie, Edward Grant, um, David Lindbergh, and again. Catholic or non-Catholic, but they're committed to the truth, you will not find very many historians of science today who echo the old point of view. But it's taken us hundreds of years to get to this point, to get historians who are willing to get rid of the Enlightenment baggage and say, you know what, let's look at the Church dispassionately, without an agenda, without assuming that it's always wrong or stupid. Let's just look at the actual record, and lo and behold, what do they find? The truth does not seem to correspond to the comic book version of history basically that we've been getting. So my book, I wrote the, you know, why uh, or how the Catholic Church built western civilization to try to take some of this scholarly work that's been done, really good work, but that's been languishing out there that has not trickled down to the general public. The general public still believes, and I think even some Christians or Catholics in their heart of hearts, even they themselves kind of secretly suspect that maybe they've just been an obstacle to to science or all these other things I mentioned. What I'm trying to do is make this stuff available to the general public to, in, in one quick book that you can read so that you can turn around when you get accused of, of, being, of, of, you know, of holding up the progress of the West, and blah, 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 that you'll be able to defend yourself. I mean, that was, that was why I did it. You know, there is a traditional obstacle, uh, Professor, and it's, and it's the sin of presentism. Yep. We are smarter than those in the past just because. We're here because we've got computers and we've got um, cable now. And I find a lot of time on the campus, that's what I ran into a lot. They say, well, you know, religion is anti-reason, but also ah, that was a long time ago, and those people walk around in wooden shoes. Look at us now. It was like almost an inherent arrogance that came along with being the modern man. Right. You know, you're absolutely true, and, and uh, you know, you're, you got hit right on the head there, but I have to say that my own experience with students – uh, you know, now that I'm I'm sort of retired in the sense that uh, I don't teach uh, in the classroom anymore. I have a fellowship at an academic institute. Uh, I'm much too young to be permanently retired, but at least from the classroom for now uh, I am. But when I was in the classroom, um, I would look at the students that I was getting, and you know, okay, I got some decent ones who worked hard and they wanted to learn everything. But but for the most part, I would look at them and think to myself, how dare you people in particular? judge people from the past. I mean, what a bunch of slobs and do-nothings and whatever. You know, they have no knowledge. They can barely write a coherent sentence, and they're going to... I'd like to see them debate somebody like Thomas Aquinas, who would oh. wipe the floor with them, with their little arrogant little um, attitude problems and everything. No, you're absolutely right. There is this sense that that we're better because we're more recent. But if you if you look at what university life was like, say, in the 13th century, I mean, the university system, for one thing comes right out of the heart of the church. In fact, that's why Pope John Paul II, when he issued a document on Catholic universities, the document is called Ex Corde Ecclesiae, which means out of the heart of the church, because that's where the university system comes from. Uh, there was nobody in the Middle Ages who founded or uh, chartered more universities than the Pope, and I show in my book all the different ways that the church fostered the university system and fostered the kind of rational debate that's a hallmark of our Western tradition that took place in the halls of these universities, if you compare that type of vigorous debate that you had in these universities where almost nothing was off limits, with a, a, a few basic theological points were off limits, but for the most part, you could debate almost anything. The, ho the whole of Western culture in the high Middle Ages was centered on debate and you know, logical back and forth. I mean, if you look at Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, how is it organized? It's organized like a debate, like we've got people with objections, and Aquinas anticipates and answers the objections. If you compare that to our universities today, well, okay, I, I'm not going to say nothing good is going on in our universities today, but I wouldn't exactly say they're a bastion of free and open dialogue, for heaven's mm -hmm. sake. I mean, you know, you're no. walking around on eggshells at these universities. You don't want to say the wrong thing or offend the wrong group or whatever. Uh, is that really these what people happened? have no right to judge people from the past. Is that really? I mean, you would think, I mean... Uh, uh, being uh, you know optimistic that the university ultimately is a collision of ideas, and they'll always say, "Well, we want to start from scratch and let the student work his way through that and come to where we're at." But uh, so often we hear that there is maybe an ideological strangulation, but there tends to be a, well a dark ages at the university level. Well, I think so, and I mean, of course, 
one thing I recommend, a lot of times parents ask me, you know, look, we want to send our kids to college. We feel like we have to to equip them for to succeed in life. But on the other hand, we don't want to lose them, you know, to craziness. You know, and, and we want them to get through their university career without losing their faith and without losing their common sense, just their common basic conservative sense. And what do we do? And, you know, I had a couple of possible answers. You know, one is send them to a kind of conservative type school and um, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute has a college guide that's very useful on that. But, but even if you said, you know, let's say your kid gets a, you know, a great scholarship at Harvard or something, and you feel like, well, I just can't pass that up. You can. I mean, I'm living proof. You can get through Harvard and keep your sanity. And, and the way you do it is you, you find, and there are at Harvard, like-minded student groups, and you join them, and these, these students become your lifeline, your sanity lifeline. It, you, you, you all work together to stay sane and normal. And in fact, when I was in college, uh, when I was at Harvard, we had a student magazine called Peninsula, which was very controversial because we were very sort of right-wing and in-your-face. And we, you know, we would, we would take on issues that the left sort of felt like, you know, had been decided already. You know, they've taken these issues off the table. So we had an issue, for example, on homosexuality. And it was, there was not any invective or unkind word in there. It was all extremely charitable, just looking at the subject and trying to explain why this is not a good thing, not to be encouraged, and so on and so forth. Well, what sh- it just shocked the left, because their view is, look, we already established this years ago, that this is fine, that homosexuality is a good thing. How dare these people try to debate this again. I mean, they, so we would, in other words, we'd take issues that the left was so sure they had won, and we'd open them up again, drove them crazy. And we don't know if we converted many people. We have no way of knowing how many people we converted. But it almost didn't matter. We kept ourselves sane. Because sometimes people say, you know, if you write an article for a conservative magazine, you're just preaching to the choir. But, you know, sometimes the choir needs to be preached to so that they know they're not alone. And that was the way I got through Harvard, and I felt like I got through with a stronger faith than when I entered because I realized exactly what I'm up against. And after I went through Harvard, I said to myself, look, whatever these people believe in, I want to believe the exact opposite. (laughs) Wow, that's great, uh, Dr. Wood. Uh, And speaking of the educational system, um, you know, there's been much made historically, and I know you argue this in your book, about how the church always opposed the development of science. And it seems that... You know, when we put religion and science in the same sentence, it's sort of this fallacy that we're not supposed to do that, Dr. Woods. Can you give us your general impression where the church stood on science back in the Middle Ages and today? And also, you know, can you get into the story of Galileo, which I found very intriguing in your book, by the way, because that seems to be the origin where the secularist claims of religion, that religion is contrary to science study comes from. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well... What I can say basically is this, that um, there, there are two different ways that I think we can show, that, that in fact scholars have started to show, that, uh, that, that Catholicism and just the Christian religion more generally uh, contributed to the development of science. In other words, wasn't just not an obstacle to it, but positively contributed to it. And one of them is the way, the way that, that a Catholic thinks about the universe. I mean, the most, one of the most frequently cited verses in the whole Middle Ages is Wisdom 1121, which is one of the so-called deuterocanonical or apocryphal books that says that God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. Now, you listen to that, doesn't immediately jump off the page why that's important. God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight. But when you look in history, St. Augustine was very fond of quoting that verse. A lot of scholars in the Catholic tradition were fond of quoting it. So it's, it's worth noting, why, what did they think that verse meant, and what, what, what contribution does it make to the sciences? Well, their view is that if God has ordered all things according to measure, number, and weight, this means he's like a great mathematician, really. He's a great, or as St. As Augustine said, he's a great geometer. So that means that when we want to really look at the universe, really tackle it, understand it, get, you know, wrap our minds around how it works, we need to use the key of mathematics, because God is a great mathematician. He's ordered everything according to measure, number, and weight. So right away, we have this kind of mathematical approach to the universe, which is very important, because modern physics, for example, uh, has it as its goal to try to understand all the motion in the universe according to uh, simple formulas, simple simple um, mathematical formulas. I mean, that's what we want to do. We want to reduce things to mathematics. Well, that's a, that's part of that's in the very air that Christians breathe, because they, it comes right out of the Scripture, and it's, 
it's it's it reflects the fact that their god is an orderly predictable sort of rational god in the sense that yes he can perform miracles but a miracle has to occur against an orderly background or otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell it was a miracle so in other words we take for granted that our god is a god who keeps his promises is faithful to us and one of the ways he does that is by being faithful in the sense that the seasons come regularly the planets move in a regular way. There are certain patterns, mathematical patterns, that are observable in the universe that are a reflection of this regularity and faithfulness of God himself. Now, this is all important because if you don't believe the universe is basically orderly, then you have no incentive to even bother engaging in science in the first place. Because the scientific method says you go out there, you gather data, you develop hypotheses based on that data, then you run tests to test your hypothesis. And the idea is that if I run this same test under the same conditions multiple times, I'll get the same results every time because I'm living in an orderly universe. But if I don't have that conviction that I'm living in an orderly universe, well, maybe I could run the experiment on, and on the fourth time, um, you know, I'll turn into Elvis or something. I mean, you can't do science unless you expect the universe to be orderly. Now, it seems obvious to us that the universe is sort of orderly. We just take this for granted. But not all civilizations got that point. And I think that one useful contrast is the ancient Babylonians believed that the universe is not fundamentally orderly, it's fundamentally chaotic. And in fact, it's no surprise, the ancient Babylonians did not develop science. They're living in a chaotic universe. How do you begin to study uh, a chaotic universe? But beyond that is the Islamic example. Now, in the case of, of Muslim scholars, it's true that in practical sciences, that we might say, like um, optics or medicine, they made some contributions. But when it comes to theoretical sciences, they have much more difficulty. And the basic reason is this. Their understanding of, of God is that, is that Allah is so overwhelmingly powerful in the sense that his will is... His will is, is simply so overwhelming that if you were to say that there are natural laws and order, the orderliness built into the universe, that would simply be insulting his absolute sovereignty. Sure. He's not subject to any laws of gravity or anything like that. He can change his mind on a whim. Tomorrow, tomorrow that's, that river could run upstream, uh, and, and that's just the way God is. Well, you know, if that's your view of the universe, that it's not predictable – and that you can't make regular generalizations about how it's going to behave, how can you have science? But you so know what? These ideas that come from our religion I spill over your, to science. And I love that, that get, getting back to the basics of how one interprets the world around them. If you interpret the world around you as willy-nilly, and that there's a God above who pulls the sun across the sky, and who, who dictates what goes on every single day, then the, you cannot forecast the next day. The, the world is an utter mystery to you. Exa that's, it, that's it. That's exactly it. And the Koran, and just to uh, take another step there, the Koran is an instruction manual. I mean, it dictates I mean, almost every aspect of your life. Yeah, exactly. There is not the sense of secondary causation. That, yes, you know, God is in a fundamental sense the cause of everything, but but you know, other people do play a role in working out their own destiny. I mean, God is not the one. If I'm playing pool, He doesn't actively intervene at every moment to make sure that 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 cue ball is going to go across the table. I mean, this is this is secondary causation. But beyond this sort of theoretical stuff, there's just the fact that you know the Jesuits, which are an important order of priests founded in 1540. The Jesuits have been so accomplished in the sciences that 35 Jesuits actually have lunar craters named after them, I mean, craters on the moon with their names. But no, we know kids are not taught that. Or in the 20th century, the Jesuits were so uh, accomplished when it came to the study of earthquakes that seismology was called the Jesuit science. And even to this day, every year the American Geophysical Union awards a medal to an exceptional young geophysicist. And guess what? The medal is named after Father J.B. McElwain, who was the Jesuit who wrote the first textbook on seismology in America in the 1930s. And you can just keep going on and on. The first person to measure how fast a freely falling body accelerates to the ground was another Jesuit. Or my favorite uh, sort of bit of trivia about this was in the early 19th century, 
there was a historian of mathematics who wanted to figure out who were the greatest mathematicians of the past from 900 B.C. to his day, about 1800 A.D. So he's going back 27 centuries. He wants to see who are the greatest mathematicians. Comes up with a list of about 300 mathematicians. 5% of those mathematicians were Jesuits. Now consider that the Jesuits were only around for about two of those 27 centuries, founded in 1540, and then they were suppressed for a time in the 1770s. So just over two centuries. And there are only one order of Catholic priests, and yet this one order of priests around for only two centuries, one out of 20 of the greatest mathematicians ever belonged to it. Now, and, and believe me, I could go on and on. The longest chapter of my book is on science, but, yes. but the point is made here that how often do we get this stuff taught to our kids, ever? Like, it ne you never even hear it, never, zero. But I think that brings us, shall I, shall I go to the Galileo matter Please. at this point? Yes, that's a great yes. story. Okay. I think our audience would love that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best. And, and I'll, I'll first point out that Cardinal Newman, in case people don't know, Cardinal, John Henry Cardinal Newman was a 19th century convert from Anglicanism to Catholicism, uh, probably the most, most famous convert of his day. And Newman was a great historian in his own right, but one of the things he wrote in his autobiography was, that the Galileo case is, it was in his words, the one stock argument that opponents of the church will typically refer to. They'll say, well, you know, what about Galileo? You know, doesn't that show that you people hate knowledge and so on and so sure. forth? And, and what, what Newman was getting at was, he, what, he, what he was implying there was, let's suppose we even grant people the Galileo case. What else have you got? If you, if you say to somebody, well, what else have you got other than Galileo? What they'll usually do is point somewhere and say, hey, look over there, and then they run away because they haven't got anything other than Galileo. But and I'll say at the beginning also that the Galileo case is not exactly the church's shining moment, and I, I don't want to be uh, interpreted as saying that, you know, that the church did exactly the right thing and the pope is to be congratulated, Pope Urban VIII, uh, for the way he handled this, because it has been used now by the church's enemies for centuries as bogus evidence that all well, the church just hates scientific inquiry. So it's been a disaster. But at the same time, we should at least, if we're going to look at this, know what actually happened. And the quick version is basically as follows. I mean, I, I give, like, I think an eight-page overview of this in, in the book. But the basic overview is that Galileo believed that the Earth was going around the sun. I think people know that, that part. So he believes the Earth's going around the sun. And this was something that had been taught since yeah, the Yeah, it's not a new idea. But yeah, no, it was not a new idea. It had been taught by. I mean, there were some ancient Greeks who who taught it, but but it didn't really catch on. But but in the 16th century, Copernicus taught it, and in fact, Cop Copernicus was a Polish astronomer. Copernicus actually dedicated his book on the subject to Pope Paul III, and it was cardinals of the church who urged him to publish it on his deathbed in 1543. But when he was dying and he had it published, it, it wasn't that he had hesitated to publish because he was afraid he'd get burned at the stake or excommunicated. What he was afraid of was the ridicule of other scientists. Because the problem was that neither Copernicus nor Galileo nor other people who later believed this, uh, this so-called heliocentric theory of the, the Earth going around the sun, th none of them could answer some serious scientific arguments against it. And next year, I don't know if it's going to be the spring or the summer, I actually have a, 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 a television series uh, that I that I have taped uh, 13 programs based on my book for uh, for EWTN. I, maybe you guys know the the Catholic Television Network. That's and, right. Yes. And on on one of the episodes, I actually give a graphical um, explanation. I, I I draw it all out and show what the arguments against the heliocentric theory were in the in the 16th and 17th centuries that these guys couldn't answer. So what we need to bear in mind is that in the early 17th century, it was quite possible for you to believe the sun went around the earth and not just be a complete dolt. Like we, cannot, we, we should not say that anybody who didn't accept the views of Copernicus and Galileo was just a complete moron who wouldn't accept evidence. To the contrary, Galileo and Copernicus could not answer the argument about stellar parallax, but as I say, that, that I can, uh, I'll be showing on my TV series. The point is there were serious scientific reasons not to believe in Galileo. In fact, Galileo's argument, because sometimes... Um, you know, people want to know, what's your evidence that the Earth is moving? Because it doesn't seem like the Earth is moving, right? I mean, it seems like the Earth is staying still. Why do you think it's moving? And his argument was that, um, uh, let's, let's see, how, what exactly was this thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Galileo said that, that um, the combination 
of, he said the tides, the tides is the evidence that the earth is moving, that, that, that what we see in the ocean. He said because what, the, what causes the tides, according to Galileo, was that you've got the earth going around the sun, revolving around the sun, and simultaneously rotating on its axis. And the combination of these movements sort of shakes up the water, like one of those snow globes with the, the snow being shaken up, and that's what causes the tides, which, I mean, no scientist would do anything but laugh at that today. That was the best he could do. So, it, again, we can't just say he was a genius and everybody else was a moron. He was a genius, but there were other geniuses on the other side of this question. Well, the long and the short of it is, the Church had not ever said that you can't teach the Copernican theory that the Earth goes around the sun. And to the contrary, uh, Catholic universities taught that for generations as a theory. But as I say, since there were serious scientific objections to it, and there were biblical verses that at least seemed to imply that the earth was staying still, the church took this cautious position, saying that we should treat the heliocentric theory as a theory at this point. And in fact, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine said, and he was later canonized, he said, if absolutely inc incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence is shown to me that the earth is going around the sun, then it would be time to go back and look once again at these biblical verses and see if perhaps we may have misinterpreted them all this time. But until these proofs are shown to me, I see no reason to abandon my view. So he's not taking a totally unreasonable, I'm blocking my eyes and ears view, la la la, I can't hear anything you're saying. He's not taking that position. So what, what basically happened was, even though Galileo was being praised and feted and welcomed by bishops and cardinals and popes, even into the 1620s, the problem he had was he, he wanted to teach that the Copernican theory was fact. And beyond that, he then wanted to say, and now let me start reinterpreting some of these biblical verses for you. Well, okay, now he is traipsing onto the theologian's home turf. And it mm. seemed that this is sort of an uppity layman. Who does he think he is telling us what the Bible means? And this is, remember, this is only a century after Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation uh, and a lot of the Protestants had accused Catholics of not taking the Bible seriously. So there was some concern, can we let this lay scientist run around reinterpreting the Bible like this uh, at a time when we're all accused of not taking the Bible seriously enough? And beyond that, there's the fact that, you know, sometimes just personalities uh, can, can change and affect history. And Galileo, according to all accounts, was a, was a jerk in, in terms of his, his, what we might today call people skills. So if he disagreed with you, let's say, on what causes sunspots, you weren't just a scientist who had a different theory from him. You were a blockhead, and he would say so publicly. So these types of things, his abrasiveness, uh, the church's concern about the Bible, all these things combined with the last straw by Galileo, which was the Pope had told him, you have to teach you the, the Copernican theory simply as a theory for the time being. Well, Galileo writes up this dialogue uh, like a little, almost like a play, and he puts this view that you know, well, we should just treat it as a theory, and you know, it's just the most elegant way of explaining planetary mo uh, uh, motion, but it might not actually be literally true. We don't know that yet. He puts that view into the mouth of the dunce character in his dialogue. Now, this is not going to ingratiate himself into the Pope's favor when the Pope's view right. is put into the dumb guy guy. So, so that's basically the gist of it. So in 1633, Galileo was condemned, and his, his, uh, his work was condemned. But as I show in my book, you know, uh, scientists uh, following him you know, more or less continued along these lines, and it was kind of assumed and, and uh, taken for granted among people that, this, that these censures were really aimed personally at him rather than uh, entirely than at the theory in a blanket way, because Roger Boscovich and others continued to... to uh, do research, taking for granted the, the Copernican theory. But I think that this, this episode, as regrettable as it is, at the same time you can see that it, it kind of boils down to a lot of pettiness and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, decisions that we wish we could, we could have back. But it certainly does not in and of itself show that the Church just simply is an enemy of science because, as I say, her contributions to the sciences are, if it's just the Jesuits alone, are so overwhelming yeah. Uh, and, and you've got Jesuit priests. I mean, a priest is the highest office the church affords other than a bishop or pope. You've got them being great scientists all over the place, and I give example after example after example. I think it's much fairer to say the Galileo episode is an unfortunate exception to the rule. It is not the rule. 
And that, I think, is where people are just not being fair, because they don't know enough about church history to know that this really is the exception rather than the rule. Professor, can I ask you a general question on religion? Sure. Um, we In our chat room right now, we've got a, a vigorous debate going on, and, and this guy is, is asking you, a guy from Aware Talk Radio, he's saying, religion, it's just a concoction meant to medicate the masses. Ah, okay. Can you give me your, your sense of religion and its, and its birth, its effect? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And, and, you know, I would be trying to follow along with this, but when I went to your website, uh, it started making a lot of noise. And I thought, oh, I can't have there being noise in the background, so I had to close the window out. Uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find out how to, how to make it stop. But, um, well, I don't know. I have a couple of uh, responses that come, just come to mind. I mean, sometimes it's been said that, you know, if, if God, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a communist anarchist thinker who said that if God did not exist, um, we would have to invent him. Or in fact, no, that may actually have been Voltaire who said uh, if, if God did not exist, we would have to invent him. With the idea being that, you know, uh, if, if there really weren't a God, we would nevertheless want there to be religion because we needed to sort of keep people in line, you know, make them afraid of hell so that they'll behave themselves on this earth. And I've sometimes thought to myself, though, and, and here I'm kind of following a, an argument from Scott Hahn, suppose you were inventing a religion, you know, suppose you're inventing a religion. Would you invent one in which the God knew everything that you did and thought? Even, like, there wasn't even a little corner you could crawl into where you could have some private thoughts. Like, wh- would this be the one that you would, you would just spontaneously invent? Or, or more to the point, suppose you're going to invent a religion. Would you invent one in which the, the protagonist of the religion dies humiliated and abandoned on a cross? You know, I mean, like, is that, does that seem like a religion that, that you would just invent? Like, why wouldn't you invent a religion in which he triumphantly comes down off the cross and slays all his enemies? I mean, in other words, this religion runs so counter to our normal, ordinary human expectations that, you know, I've sometimes thought that it has to be divine. Because I can't imagine this coming out of a purely human head. In fact, um, I, I know this can easily be taken out of context, but Tertullian, who was a late 2nd century, early 3rd century figure, actually said, credo quia absurdum, I, I believe because it is absurd, and, 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 and in this sort of sense, that, that the, the whole story of the Christian religion runs exactly counter to what we would expect. And yet, there it is. Yet it has compelled people, it has moved people, so it doesn't immediately it doesn't it doesn't conform to this kind of view that well you know it's just some just some arbitrary creation and particularly if the apostles had just invented it why do they why is why does why is their testimony so basically human sounding where they admit their own failings and yeah we betrayed him we we couldn't understand what he was saying you know why don't they do what normal human beings would do which would be to say oh and of course we knew everything he meant and we never betrayed him we were right by his side like why would they be so self-effacing if they're going to invent a religion you know so i mean in other words now none of this proves anything but i think it's at least suggestive it at least makes you think that if this is a merely invented story well it sure doesn't conform to any other invented story i've ever heard of so that i think right off the bat that type of accusation has to be rejected but secondly in my book, uh, in the chapter on the university, I actually give an argument, a philosophical argument for the existence of God, which I, I can't duplicate here because it would take too long. But it probably goes on two or three pages. And uh, if, you, if you read the book, it's the one that involved the, the meat at the deli counter. But I have not heard anybody answer that argument satisfactorily. Now, it doesn't prove that the Christian God is the true God. But I think my argument there, which is building on St. Thomas Aquinas' argument from... Um, from contingency um, and and uh, and that and and and, that's, and and the impossibility of there being an infinite series of, of causes uh, and the first cause argument, I've never heard a satisfactory response to that. So I think a lot of my students, for instance, used to think before they had me when I taught them Western Civ, they used to think that religious people are just people who don't really require explanations for anything. You know, they just blindly believe because they're just stupid. Well, look, there are a lot of things atheists believe that they are blindly believing, you know, I mean, about how it is that the universe came into being or, how, you know, all these things. There are a lot of things that people can't possibly verify, but that they believe uh, uh, very seriously. But what I showed them was that actually, no, there are, 
there are philosophical arguments that a lot of atheists feel like were answered years ago. Centuries ago, we answered those arguments. Actually, they were answered very badly, if at all. They were usually just ridiculed. They weren't actually answered. And my friend Ed Fazer, who used to be on, uh, I think, gosh, it was the, I don't know if it's the Intellectual Conservative or Right Reason. There was some, some conservative philosopher's blog that just closed down that he was on. Ed Fazer is a philosopher on the West Coast, is writing a book. He's the, probably one of the more brilliant philosophers I know, in which he goes through these arguments and uses them against Richard Dawkins and all the fashionable atheists. So that will be a book to look for. But wow. the point is you can at least make intelligent arguments. Now, as I say, it doesn't answer all questions, but nothing answers all questions in this life. Nothing. Atheism doesn't answer all questions. But when I just look at the whole package, I see that I can make a good philosophical argument that there's a God. I look at the details of this particular religion, and it does not sound made up to me. I look at the testimony of 2,000 years where you've had every dictator and king or whatever trying to overthrow this institution, and it's still there, you know, a lot of it seems to add up. Or, and then beyond that, I've got cases like, who can duplicate the heroism of Mother Teresa? Hillary Clinton? You know what I mean? Like, what does, what does the natural world have that can compare with, with, uh, with Mother Teresa? Or when I, have, when I have examples like Padre Pio, St. Padre Pio, now even if 99.8 percent of the miraculous events attributed to Padre Pio, who lived during, well, he died just before I was born, but um, he lived into the late, late 60s. If even just, if even point, you know, point two percent of these miraculous things attributed to Padre Pio are true, then you have a very, very serious difficulty for, uh, for people who would deny the possibility of the supernatural. Because, I mean, all you have to do is just read any book on Padre Pio will tell you that he used to be able to, in effect, read your heart uh, he would know he would know like people who were atheists and skeptics would go and try and challenge him in fact there's one story of a gentleman who's an atheist and he came in and he said okay today is the day of my patron saint because the guy had been born a catholic and then just abandoned the faith today's the day of my patron saint if after his mass padre pio comes up to me and says well happy saint's day to me well then i'll believe you and sure enough right after his mass walks right over and says happy saint's day <laughs> i mean and and i could multiply that times a trillion well, okay, even if only 10,000 of those are true, I, I always think of, of this type of thing as a, as a gift from God, a totally unmerited gift from God on our part for those of us who are weak in our faith, that once in a while we get somebody like this that reminds us, no, no, we're on the right track, we are on the right track, that, that um, you know, the, the 20th century, I think, should have reminded us that it's not just religion that can motivate people to kill people. Um, you know, I, I mean, uh, in the entire Middle Ages or the entire Inquisition, uh, Stalin killed more people on a good afternoon than the entire Inquisition over hundreds of years. I mean, shouldn't he at least bear that in mind? It doesn't excuse it, but it puts things into perspective, I think. And uh, and Dr. Woods, and you know, with, with Padre Pio, it's also hard to ignore the stigmata that he walked around with. I think that convinced a lot well, of people. That's right. Now, now, very recently, the past few days, uh, there was a there was an author in Italy who's trying to claim that he used carbolic acid on his hands. Oh. To, oh. <laughs> now, which, which, he's got physicians who were repeatedly investigating this who would obviously have seen through a ruse like that, and they repeatedly said there was no physician during his lifetime who ever said, oh, this is just some phony. They all walked away saying, I, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, it really is amazing um, in regards to Potter Pugh and, and, and the denials that many try to uh, sort of dismiss uh, what happened um, to now the saints. But but you know, to get back to your book, Professor Woods, you know, one of my favorite chapters was Chapter 7, The Origins of International Law. And I, found, I have to admit, I found this chapter very fascinating because, uh, again, as a history major, I was taught of the evils of the Catholic Church, specifically in South America. Um, you know, I, I was even taught that when the Catholic Church came over in the 15th and 16th centuries there, that, that not only did they try to convert the Catholic, I'm uh, sorry, the, the Native American Indians, but they also attempted to take their gods and make them into saints, which, which if you're a Catholic, you know is ludicrous. Right. It's, uh, just, that's, that's an untenable position in the Catholic Church. Right. But, but my question is, what link... Between the, what is the link between the Catholic Church and the Spanish discovery of South America? Was the brutality the same, or, or was Catholicism used, Catholicism used more as an excuse to conquer rather than to spread the faith? Well, I mean, I, I, I come down kind of in the middle on this, that, that I think that 
there were uh, th- there were some serious atrocities perpetrated by Spaniards who consider themselves to be Catholics, but at the same time, the popes, you know, it's very very hard to indict the popes for this because they they, they have a an excellent record of of denouncing the slave trade and denouncing anybody who would enslave these people. They said who should hear the gospel freely and not be enslaved. You had Franciscan priests going down there and lecturing the Spanish, saying, how dare you be thieves of men and do this and that. And then at the same time this is going on, back in Spain, in Spanish universities, you've got Spanish priests who are saying, you know, our government is, you know, is, is kind of looking the other way when, when our own people are mistreating people around the world. And it was at that moment that they began to think, well, you know, how should we treat people around the world? And this type of question led to philosophical reflection that, that yielded us something like an early human rights view, that, you know what, in a fundamental sense, since all people possess reason, that's the thing that distinguishes us from the, the animal kingdom, we possess reason, that makes us fundamentally equal in a, in a basic sense. So we should treat them the way we would want them to treat us, or we should treat them the way we treat other Europeans. This is a huge step forward morally in the history of the world, because when you look at Native American tribes, for example, in the United States, Well, I I quote uh, the Harvard historian Samuel Elliott Morrison as having said that, in fact, a lot of these American tribes, uh, their their word for enemy and member of another tribe was the same word. Or or the member of another tribe would be called the barbarian or son of the she-dog or something equally insulting. So if your view is that my tribe is always right and everybody else is a barbarian or the son of the she-dog, how could you ever develop this sense that fundamentally all peoples are equal, all peoples are, are owed a certain level of dignity and respect and, and treatment? How could you ever have developed those ideas? These ideas come out of the Western tradition, and they, don't, they do not come out of these native traditions. And that is at least, I think, at least one important mitigating factor on behalf of the West. Hey, uh, Professor, we are down to our last minute. Can you tell us about... A- this television series I heard you just say just a word or two about? Yes, right. Uh, um, sometime in 2008, uh, EWTN, the Catholic Television Network, is going to air a 13-program series based on my book, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. So I'll be elaborating on a lot of the points that we covered tonight. And if you're like me, I don't mean you specifically, I mean all listeners, uh, if you're a cheapskate like me and you like free things, then my website will be just what the doctor ordered, because if you go to thomasewoods.com, you can get a free chapter of the book that we just talked about and a lot of free audio and all kinds of free things, and there isn't even a link to send me a donation. Send it to Shane and Frank. I don't need any donations. I'm happy to give this stuff for free, but uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys, and I'm sorry I talked I talk too much. I'm sorry about that. You know what? No, it was, I can't it was myself. You know what? I, don't, I love it, and I love the intelligence and the eloquence, and we don't hear it enough. And we live in a world uh, where we can look over across the ocean, uh, Professor, and see Europe and see the situation that's brewing over there where religion has become a mockery. And we have people walking around empty, and we can see the damage that it's doing. I see the damage. Uh, And so having you here tonight, good Lord, I'd have you on every week to bring this (laughs) message. I appreciate that, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, good night. Good night now. Uh, and uh, you know, again, the chat room was on fire tonight, man. Thank you to Donna and Lucky and Jenna the Jungle and all the great people that just you know had a great debate and great conversation there. Shane loved it. Awesome. We're not going to be able to play our closing song. Looks like our soundboard is gone. So I just want to say thank you all for coming in tonight. Appreciate everything, and see you next week, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Pacific. Political Vindication Radio, come and join us over at politicalvindication.com. Let's continue this conversation. And until next week, Frank, see you then, and uh, God bless America.